We've been talking about how there are many, many names for God that are revealed to us in Scripture. There are many names and titles for the Father. There are many names and titles for the Holy Spirit. There are many names and titles for Jesus the Son. And we've been talking about four of the names of Jesus that are revealed to us in one verse of ancient prophecy written by the prophet Isaiah 700 years before the birth of Jesus. These words were written about the future Messiah who would one day come. And we've covered the first two names in this series so far. We've got two names to go. And we've been reading this specific scripture from Isaiah each week. But before we do that today, I want to back up a few verses. And I want to give you a little bit of extra Christmas context. Because C-I-E, context, is everything, right? Now, historically, we know that Jesus was not actually born on December 25th. So why do we celebrate his birth on that day? Well, around 400 AD, the Roman Catholic Church absorbed and then replaced the ancient pagan festival of Saturnalia, which was a feast that worshipped the Roman god Saturn. And the idea was to kind of give an entryway for pagans to come into Christianity, which was at that time the official religion of the Roman Empire, established as such by the Emperor Constantine about 70 years earlier. Saturnalia was based on the winter solstice, the time, when the, year, time of year when the earth is furthest from the sun, and the nights are the longest and the days are the shortest. It's the darkest, coldest time of the year. And then after the winter solstice, things begin to change for the better. The days get steadily longer and warmer, and more and more light comes back into the darkness of the world. Saturnalia celebrated the return of the sun into the darkest, coldest time of the year. They referred to it as Dies Natalis Solus Invicti, the birthday of the unconquerable sun, S-U-N, sun. And obviously that made some of the symbolism in us as Christians celebrating the birth, the arrival, the advent of Jesus, the son, S-O-N, son of God, the light of the world who came into the spiritual darkness of the world. And we said, hey, that's a good time of year for us to celebrate that. They did the same thing with the spring. Uh, pagan festival uh, at the spring equinox that originally worshipped the Sumerian goddess Ishtar and Esther and had symbols of bunnies and eggs connected to it. Uh, so we know where all those things came from. And that eventually became the secular version of what we would now call Easter. And that version of Easter really has nothing at all to do with Jesus, which is why a lot of Christians prefer to call it Resurrection Sunday rather than Easter. But let's get back to Saturnalia and the Roman Catholic Church's absorption of this festival. It all morphed together, and we kept some of those pagan traditions, things like evergreen trees and holly and mistletoe. All of that was all part of that ancient festival, but now it all was part of a new festival called Christ. Mass, the Mass of Christ, what we call Christmas, the birthday of Jesus. Except December 25th is not actually the birthday of Jesus. We've talked about this before, that he was likely conceived around this time of year. When we go through the scriptures and we see when John the Baptist was conceived and know that uh, he was related to Jesus and that Mary went and visited Elizabeth. And we can do that timeline of when all that would have happened. And it says, oh, okay, Mary would have gotten pregnant for Jesus right around this time of year, right around the Feast of Hanukkah. Uh, but we know that Jesus was likely born just after sunset on the first night of the Feast of Sukkot, also known as Tabernacles or Booths. So if we go back and do the best historical research we can, that means it was on a Saturday, September 16th, 5 BC. That's probably historically the best guess for when Jesus' actual birthday is. We know through a deep study of our Hebrew roots and how God linked all the significant events of Jesus' birth, death, resurrection, giving of the Holy Spirit, prophecies of the second coming, all of those are linked to the seven key feasts of the Lord in the Hebrew Scriptures. So Sukkot is one of these Hebrew feasts still celebrated 
today, as I mentioned, known in English as the Feast of Booze, the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, we've celebrated it here a few times with another church in Waimea that celebrates it each year. And I go into all of these feasts, including Sukkot, in a lot of depth in a different series. Those of you who've been with me for five years or more might be sick of hearing about it by now because I talk about it a lot. But learning of more and more about our Hebrew roots, that was a life-changing revelation for me. And few Christians really know about it. So really laying all that happened on Sukkot, laying all that out, it's more than we have time for uh, today. But I just want to give you that context to better understand what we're talking about today. So I want to be really clear about this. I am not anti-Christmas. I love Christmas. I love celebrating Christmas. I love all of the Christmas traditions, both the Christian traditions and the secular traditions. I love the trees. I love the wreaths. I love the decorations. I love the vegan cookies and fruitcake. And Annette has me even warming up to the Hallmark Channel Christmas movies this year, believe it or not. Uh, please don't make me turn in my man card, but they're pretty good. You know? And so I'm not opposed to celebrating Jesus' birth at Christmas time. I celebrate Jesus 24-7, 365. Do you agree with that? Say amen. And so Christmas, though, is a special opportunity to really do that because others around the world, even those who aren't Christians, are thinking of the same thing this time of year. So I've mentioned in passing a couple of times in this series already, Part of the Feast of Sukkot involved the lighting of these huge 75 to 86 foot tall lampstands in the temple courtyard in Jerusalem. And whenever they did that during the Feast of Sukkot, the glow could be seen for miles and miles around. And so during this particular feast in Jerusalem, this city on a hill was known as the light of the world. And so when we read in the Gospel of John, when Jesus claims that title for himself, I am the light of the world, you can note, if you go through the study with Canute, you'll see this, it's right after the Feast of Tabernacles. That's when Jesus makes that statement. After everybody's been focusing on the light of the world, the light of the world, the light of the world, Jesus then says, hey, you know what, that thing we've been celebrating, that's me. I'm the light of the world. And so he was giving all those speaking to that he was speaking to a clue about his true identity and his first advent or his first birth. And if you put it all together, clues to the timing of his second advent as well. When he comes again, we'll know it's going to be connected to these uh, fall feasts. So Sukkot was also known as the season of our joy. That was one of the ways they referred to it. It was also a harvest festival known as the ingathering festival. And then during the Feast of Sukkot, all the Jewish people were commanded by God to attend in Jerusalem, to be gathered in to Jerusalem. It was also known as the Feast of the Nations. Why? Because on Yom Kippur, the Israelites made atonement for themselves, for their own sins, so that they could essentially be priests to the 70 Gentile nations around them later during the Feast of Sukkot. Again, there's a lot more to that beyond today's scope. I just want you to make sure you know these references to the nations and the season of our joy and the harvest festival. All those things are often tied to the Feast of Sukkot. So Sukkot in the year of Jesus' birth was the same time that Caesar Augustus, took advantage of this massive Jewish pilgrimage, and he said, I'm going to order a census to be taken. So when Mary and Joseph traveled to nearby Bethlehem for the census, essentially one of the suburbs of Jerusalem, and they found no room at the inn, of course, uh, that's what he's referring to. And then later, we know they settled in Nazareth, right, which is in the land of Galilee. That's where Jesus began his public ministry about 30 years later, revealing himself to be the way, the truth, and the life. The way is significant today, especially because initially Christians were just known as followers of the way. The name Christian came later. If you would have met an early Christian, they would have said, I'm a follower of the way. I'm a follower of the way, right? Christianity itself was known as the way, not Christianity initially. So keep all that in mind in context as you hear Isaiah's prophecy again. Sukkot, Light of the world, season of our joy, feast of the nations, Jesus from Galilee, the way, etc., etc., etc. So now, with fresh eyes, with all that context, let's look at what Isaiah says about the coming Messiah. If you read this and you knew all that context, when and where would you expect him to be born? Look at what Isaiah says in 
chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And would you read this last part aloud with me? And he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I know I bang this Hebrew roots drum loudly a lot, but it's because it's so important. It's vital for us as Christians to understand these things if we're really going to fully understand the Word of God and the true nature of Christianity, which is at its core a sect of Judaism. And when you know that stuff, Isaiah may as well have just said, hey, listen, the Messiah is going to be born during the Feast of Sukkot, and he will begin his ministry as the way from Galilee. It's that apparent. And so we've already covered two of these names of Jesus that Isaiah revealed, Wonderful Counselor and Mighty God. Today we're going to take a deeper look at this other phrase that he uses, Everlasting Father. Now, this name for Jesus strikes people a little bit strange because, after all, isn't Jesus the Son and God the Father, God the Son? Isn't Jesus the Son? How can he be also known by the title Everlasting Father? So, if you're watching online right now on Facebook Live or you're watching here in the building with me, if you are new to Christianity, this can sometimes be a little confusing. But here's what you need to know about Christians. Christians believe God is a triune being. Maybe you've heard the word Trinity before. God is three in person, yet one in essence. He is Father and Son and Holy Spirit, and yet he is still only one God. He told the people in John 10, 30, Jesus did, I and the Father are one. The Pharisees wanted to stone him to death for saying this. They got what he was saying. He's saying, I and the everlasting Father are one in essence. We are the same. We are one. And they saw that as blasphemy. And if he were just a man, it would have been blasphemy. But the disciples, they struggled with picking up what he was trying to say. They struggled with this idea at first. So Jesus gave them some more context in John 14. Again, if you want to really dig deep into this, make sure you come to Canute's Bible study on Wednesday mornings. He's going through the book of John. You'll get to see a little bit more depth about this conversation. He's telling the disciples, I don't want you to be worried about me leaving you. Uh, he's telling them, I'm going to die. I'm going to go back to the Father. I'm going to go prepare an eternal safe place for you in my Father's house. Thomas and Philip, two of the disciples, both asked him some clarification questions because they were like, what do, you, what do you mean? What are you talking about? And this is how Jesus responded. First, he spoke to Thomas. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip's still confused. He says, Lord, show us the Father and it's enough for us. And Jesus said to him, have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works, the miracles I've done themselves. This is one of many scriptures behind the Christian doctrine of saying we believe God is a trinity, three in person, yet one in essence. He is Father, He is Son, He is Holy Spirit. They share the same mind, they share the same heart. They share the same character. They share the same purpose. They share the same essence. They are one and the same. And yet, our one God operates and interacts with us in all these different ways as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus told us if we ever wonder what God the Father is like, all we have to do 
is look at God the Son, Jesus, because he and the Father are one. If you've seen him, you know him. You have seen. You do know the Father. And so that's why it makes sense for Isaiah to also recognize Jesus, the future Messiah, by the name Everlasting Father. Father, incidentally, was Jesus' favorite way to refer to God. He uses this term Father 65 times in the Synoptic Gospels and over 100 times in the Gospel of John. In the Pauline letters, the Apostle Paul refers to God as Father over 40 times. So, of course, for some, this word Father, it brings some good memories, some good emotions of love and nurture and strength and support. And then for others, the word father brings up bad memories, things like aloofness or absenteeism or overly strictness or maybe even abusiveness where no love at all was ever shown from their father. And in many pastoral counseling sessions I've had, people say to me, well, Pastor Greg, if God is a father, <laughs> then I want nothing to do with him. And I say, why do you say that? And they tell me how, what a terrible relationship they had with their earthly father. And the problem is we tend to project our memories, our perspectives about our own earthly fathers onto God as our heavenly father. That's not the right thing to do. The other thing we need to remember, and especially I want you to think about this today, if you had that kind of a difficult relationship with a father or a father figure in your life, recognize being a father is hard. We work hard to provide for our family, but that means we don't get to spend as much time with them as we want to. And sometimes dads make mistakes. Sometimes dads are too harsh. Sometimes dads aren't present enough. Sometimes dads don't know how to show love because their own dads didn't know how to show love to them. So if we start to see God the Father as the same as our earthly fathers, that's a mistake. The primary way Jesus revealed God to us was as a perfect, loving, attentive, wise, supportive, all-present, all-protective, all-powerful daddy. In other words, if you could take all the best mothers and all the best fathers who had ever lived throughout the course of human history and somehow join them all together into one person, that person would still only be a faint shadow of the personal care, love, mercy, grace, and provision that we can find in a relationship with our everlasting Father right now. You might remember one day Jesus was walking with the disciples through the Kidron Valley, and he was praying. And the disciples were kind of standing and watching him pray. They were in awe of the way Jesus prayed. Because he did it in such a calm, assured, confident way. It was almost like he was just sitting on a couch in the living room having a conversation with God. And the disciples were awed by that. And they asked Jesus how to pray. They said, John the Baptist taught his disciples how to pray. Will you teach us, your disciples, how to pray? And Jesus answered with what I like to call a revolutionary revelation. That comes from a, a guy named Brennan Manon who taught me that phrase many, many years ago. Because Jesus' answer turned much of what the disciples thought about God on its head. Up until that time, they would have never thought of God in this way. This was just not how the average Jewish person thought of God. Jesus said, when you pray, you are to say, our Father, our Father. Refer to God in all of your prayers as your Father. God is the everlasting Father. God is your Father. And then Jesus shared a prayer model that we ended up traditionalizing into something we call the Lord's Prayer. But it's not the only prayer. Every prayer you pray should begin with this concept that I'm speaking to my heavenly, everlasting Father. Some scholars believe whenever Jesus referred to the Father, he always would have used his native Aramaic language, not the Greek that we read the original New Testament in. And so he would have used the word Abba, which does mean Father, but literally it means Daddy. It's like our English Papa or English Dada, right, or Daddy. This was a revolutionary revelation to the disciples because until then they would never have dared to address God in this very intimate and familiar way as daddy, right? The father, the creator, the progenitor of the nation of Israel, the creator of the universe. Sure, I'd refer to him that way, but Jesus is saying something different here. He's saying God is your personal daddy. 
God is my dad. In the best possible sense of the word. And he's saying that we can have that kind of personal relationship with him. Like a little toddler sitting on your father's lap, talking to him, Abba, 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 my daddy. Feeling completely safe, protected, cared for, above all, loved, deeply loved by your Abba, your daddy. The Apostle John revealed to us in 1 John 4, 8, the one who does not love does not know God, for God is Love. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, the person who first helped me begin this kind of amazingly intimate and encouraging relationship with God as my Abba was a mentor of mine. We talked about him a few times over the years. His name is Brennan Manning. He wrote many books, but one of the books and the book that really changed my life was a book called Abba's Child. And in later life, about four years before he died with failing health, Brendan wrote these words in another book called The Furious Longing of God. I want to share those with you today. Brennan writes, The closer I come to death, the less inclined I am to limit the wisdom and infinity of God. The confession of John the Apostle that God is love is the fundamental meaning of the holy and adorable Trinity. Put bluntly, God is sheer being in love. And there was never a time when God was not love. The foundation of the furious longing of God is the Father who is the originating lover, the Son who is the full self-expression of that love, and the Spirit who is the original and inexhaustible activity of that love, all drawing the created universe into itself. So we talked last week about how much our Father God loves you. I think I said it 50 times in the message last week. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. Your Abba, your Daddy, loves you. God, the everlasting Father, loves you as only a perfect Father can. And we also talked last week about the need to be born again if we're ever going to be called a child of God. If we really want to know God as our personal everlasting Father, Jesus says we need to be born again. Again, we so said, what does that mean? We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember receiving Jesus as the Lord and Savior of our life, being indwelled and empowered by his Holy Spirit. He said that is the spiritual rebirth. That's the spiritual birth canal of being born again. And the focus of our Christianity should never be about avoiding punishment or about avoiding judgment or about avoiding hell through fear. The focus of our Christianity should not be just about making sure we're safe with the promise of eternal life. As we talked about last week, the focus of our Christianity should be about helping everyone else we meet also experience what we have already received when we became a born-again child of God. If we're not sharing our faith, we are sinning, and we're letting down the rest of humanity, and we're letting down our everlasting Father. Because God is clear that he wants everyone to come to him as his children in a relationship of love, not fear. This is echoed by the Apostle Paul in Romans 8, by the way. He says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. If you've been born again, filled with and led by the Holy Spirit, then you are a child of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received a spirit of adoption through which we cry, what? Abba, Father. Daddy, Father. Daddy, God. Later in Romans 8, the same chapter, look at what Paul says in verses 22 and 23 about how all of creation was looking forward to the coming of the Messiah and the opportunity to finally be able to be born again in him. He says, for we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. We've all been eagerly awaiting, groaning with this spiritual rebirth process to finally become children of God, to have the great privilege of knowing him as our everlasting father, our Abba. That's what Paul's talking about. We've all been waiting so long for this to happen. The whole journey that began with the first advent of Jesus 
will be completed when he comes again and resurrects our bodies to match our already redeemed souls. When our kids, Becca and Josh, were little, they always liked to play what I, what I call Catch the Kid. That was the name of the game. And the only rules were I wasn't allowed to know when they were going to come flying at me in the air. So I would walk into a room and they would leap off of a dresser or off of a bed or off of a headboard or some other high place. I would walk into a room and one of them would come flying at me through the air. Daddy! And I would be like, whoa, and try to catch them and not drop them on their head. That was a fun game to them. It was a terrifying game uh, to me. But there was no fear in them. Becca started this game. Josh came along learned it so sometimes there's two kids leaping at me from different angles and different heights and I'm trying to catch both kids and not drop them and the amazing thing to me was that there was never any fear in them there was this absolute assurance of course daddy will catch me daddy will never let me fall still today I will drop everything I'm doing and do whatever I can to catch them if they start to fall and they know that about me and I learned how to be that kind of daddy from Jesus, from the Holy Spirit, from my everlasting Father, from my Abba, my Daddy, who will never let me fall. He will always catch me, no matter what's going on in my life. Right after Jesus appeared to his disciples, resurrected, there's this amazing passage in John's Gospel. This happens before the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit finally comes to give all of the disciples power to be his evangelists. And this event shows up and shows what it means for us to be a born-again child of God. Because it involves faith in the person and in the atoning acts of Jesus, and it involves the Holy Spirit. And these two actions together make us born again. And therefore, that is what makes us a child of the everlasting Father, our Abba, a child of God. Look at this passage in John 20. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, they were worried they were going to be captured and killed like Jesus was, Jesus came and stood in their midst. He's resurrected from the dead. And he said to them, Peace be with you, or Shalom, right? And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side where the spear had gone and the uh, spikes had gone. And the disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. The only one who was with him in the beginning and was one with him in the beginning. And we talked about that in John's gospel last week. But the revolutionary revelation of Jesus is that God can be our Abba, our Daddy, our everlasting Father as well. We can't be begotten sons and daughters of God, but we can be adopted sons and daughters of God. And that relationship comes from being born again spiritually by accepting Jesus as the Lord and Savior of our life, by breathing in his Holy Spirit, by being filled with, by being empowered by, by being indwelled by the Holy Spirit, and therefore in that way being adopted into the family of God. So here's my closing question for you today. Is this the relationship that you have today with God? Is this the relationship you have today with God? Do you know him in this way as your everlasting father? Do you know him as your Abba, your daddy? Have you allowed God to adopt you as his son or as his daughter? I mentioned earlier, back when Jesus was telling the disciples that he and the Father are one, he also said those words, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Those are all singular terms. He's saying, I am the only way. I am the only truth. I am the only life. The only option for a relationship with the everlasting Father, the Creator, the God, the, the, the God of the universe, the only God is as a treasured and adopted son or daughter. That's the only way. And the only way to heaven, the only way to eternal life with God is through a relationship with our Messiah, Jesus, who is our wonderful counselor, who is our mighty God himself, who is our everlasting father, and he is our prince of peace. Do you know him? Do you know him in this way? Have you been born 
again in this way. Do you know him the way I'm talking about today? God wants you to know him. God so much wants you to know him. He's made himself available to you in every possible way. Look at what he says in Psalm 46, 11. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. But he's also saying, be still and know me as God. Don't, don't just know that I exist. Know me. Begin a relationship with me. This is another thing Brendan Manning taught me many years ago. It's a breathing kind of prayer challenge. And so I want to challenge you to do this tonight uh, as you're going to sleep. Uh, try and spend about five minutes doing this. Maybe you can only go a minute or two, but try to hit five minutes. There's seven syllables in this phrase, and they match our breathing pattern perfectly. So it's a great meditation kind of prayer, a way to just be still and know that he is God. Center all your focus on that. Forget all the other distractions. You hear me pray this sometimes. Lord, help us forget all the distractions of the week that has just passed. Don't, don't let us focus on all the things in the week to come. Help us focus on this moment in time. This comes from this practice. So whatever's going on in your life, just don't even think about that. Focus everything in on this phrase. Abba, I belong to you. So you breathe in. Abba, Abba. I belong to you. Abba, I belong to you. You don't have to say it out loud, just in your mind even, just Abba, I belong to you. Abba, I belong to you. And if you just center your mind in that way, be still and know that he is God. Be still and know him as God, as your Abba, as your daddy. You'll find that you will find that peace that passes understanding that the Apostle Paul talks about. All of the things you're worried about, all of the things you're stressed about will just melt away. And you'll feel a sense of peace and safety and security and hope. All of those things will come to you in that time of focused prayer. Just making sure you're being still and knowing God. Knowing that He is your Father, your Abba, your Daddy. Abba. I belong to you. Let's pray. Father, as Pat comes to join me in this closing song, touch each heart that's here today. Help them know you, not as an imperfect earthly father figure, because none of us fathers are perfect. We all blow it sometimes. But help everyone here know you instead as the perfect example of everything a father should be. And help us know you in that personal, endearing way as our daddy, our Abba. Help everyone here make that connection. I pray that everyone who's never done this before would today make this commitment that I believe, I have confidence, I have trust that Jesus is the Son of God. That he and the Father are one. That if I know Jesus, I know God. And Jesus, I have confidence that you are who you say you are. And that you'll do everything you've promised to do. I believe that you died on the cross to pay for my sins. Not just some esoteric sins of the world concept. But for my sins. You did it for me. Because you love me. So Jesus, thank you. Thank you for loving me enough to take all of my sins upon you. To nail them to the cross. To bury them in the ground and to leave the power that they had over me there for giving me a chance to have a brand new life, a new lease on life. Jesus, be the Lord of my life. You lead, I'll follow you. Jesus, be the Savior of my life. Forgive my sins. Guide me to eternal life in heaven with you. Jesus, be my Lord and Savior. If that's the prayer of your heart today, you can say, me too, God, me too. And Jesus, I want you to breathe your Holy Spirit onto me. Aloha, we say in Hawaiian. Alo, I share. Ha, my breath, my life, my spirit with you. I share my life with you. I share my breath with you. I share my spirit with you. Jesus, aloha to us today. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Not just for the empowerment of sharing the gospel, but for making us a new creature a born-again spiritual being 
a true child of God. Help every one of us today, hearing my voice, make this commitment to be a spirit-filled, born-again, fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ in every part of our life. That's my prayer for all of us today. Jesus, our wonderful counselor, our mighty God, our everlasting Father, our Prince of Peace, we worship and adore you. Amen.